Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Tuesday, January 30th. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you. It is Pitcher Week, day two, as we continue looking at starting pitchers. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to smash the like button on this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. If you're listening to us as a podcast, drop us a nice rating and review. We would really appreciate that. Uh, a couple news items as we get started pertaining to these uh, conversations. We've got Eno's pitching rankings up for subscribers to The Athletic. Check those out. Theathletic.com slash rates and barrels will get you a subscription for $2 a month for the first year if you don't have that already. We are talking about these players the way they're being drafted in NFBC leagues, so they're tiered by average draft position. These are not the rankings order-wise. We'll kind of highlight some opportunities to target players and a few players you should probably avoid over the course of this episode. Uh, part one is already available in this feed, the episode right before this one. So if you want pitchers going in the top 100 overall, we covered them already. So we pick up the conversation today, you know, in ADP tier number five. This is a group that includes Dylan Cease, Joe Musgrove, Walker Bueller, Tanner Bybee, Sonny Gray, and Justin Verlander, some really big names here. And this is a window where you could still be looking maybe for your second starting pitcher if you've been waiting a long time in a 15-team league. More likely, these are SP3s in a lot of situations, especially in a 12-team league. But there might be some potential SP1s in this group just based on you know, past levels of success that a lot of these guys have had. Let's start with Dylan Cease. He is listed as the White Sox opening day starter. I think we all have a lot of questions as to whether or not it's actually going to happen. Three straight seasons with 200 strikeouts, wildly different ratios. We've seen very good. We've seen pretty good. And last year, we just saw bad. And I think part of it is the Blake Snell-esque walk rate. That's always sort of been part of the package with Dylan Cease. And when you start to look at Blake Snell's best seasons and you start to look at Dylan Cease's best seasons, the column you often look at is the hit column. The hits relative to the innings pitched, when that gets really low, really good things tend to happen for pitchers with this profile. Do you buy my sort of soft comparison of, of Cease to Snell, where we get this sort of high variance with the ratios, even though we get excellent K numbers and the possibility for almost Cy Young caliber stuff when it clicks? Yeah, I think it's... I think that's a good one. I, I would just add that uh, Cease doesn't have the kind of uh, innings foibles that Snell does. Or yeah, less, on that yet. less injury risk based on what we've seen to this well, point in their respective careers. But when you get the bad version, you know, sometimes you're like, wow, lots of innings of the bad one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, one thing uh, that I would point out is that Dylan Cease's location plus was better than Snell's last year. Snell had a 95. Uh, Dylan Cease had a 97. Um, if you line up the worst walk rates uh, among pitchers with 100 starts last year, Cease was 14th. Snow was second uh, worst. So um, it is. It's a good comparison. I'm not saying it's not, but uh, uh, but like we did. We even talk about how bad Kodai Senga's command is. I when, don't know if that came up as much as it was just mentioned that the walks got better from the first half into the second half. And they were still a, a little higher than you'd like to see. I think it was like a 9.5% walk rate or something close to that from Senga when everything was starting to fall into place in the second half. Kodai Senga's uh, uh, Location Plus is... And Location Plus looks at uh, count and pitch type adjusted locations at the plate and and, and says who's who, who does that well. Uh, Kodai Senga had a 95, um, whereas uh, Cease had a 97. Uh, but I, you know, I also wanted to focus on the fastball uh, location plus because could I sing his fork ball? Like maybe it doesn't have a good location plus, but people swing at it anyway. You know, I did have an executive tech tell me that, you know, it seems like with split fingers, people swing at it even at really low zone rates. So maybe that's affecting Kodai Senga's overall number because Kodai Senga's fastball location plus is 97. Blake Sells, Sells was 91. Mm. Cease is a 95. 95 for uh, a fastball location plus is not great. Uh, it's pretty bad. But um, I've got some other names here that also have 95s. Jordan Montgomery. Uh, Patrick Sandoval. Uh, Charlie Morton. I don't know why I have to say his name that way. <laughs> I mean, he did pitch... <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, yeah, last century. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Charlie. Uh, Ken Waldachuk, 
uh that's obvious paul blackburn also down here but um 96 is kyle bradish um kyle gibson is is a 97 clayton kershaw was a 97 uh, so my point is i think it's bad but i don't think it's so bad you know who's so bad michael kopak is an 89 i think he might need to be a reliever you know uh, Luis Medina, who everyone's like minus minus command, 93. Johan Oviedo, real sort of real found foundational command issues, 93. Uh, Patrick Sandoval, 94. So I don't know. I think it's bad, but I think it's something he can overcome. Um, his his breaking balls morph together a little bit. Dylan Ceases did. I, I think if he comes with three pitch pitcher and just answer the middle of the zone a little bit, um, he can outstuff it. I mean, if it's a little bit more worse than with Sandoval where the stuff isn't quite there. At least with Cease, you're like, okay, you know, I see a glass now way forward for you. Glass now again, glass now Yeah, that debate's been raging on in the comments in YouTube. But uh, can continue with the uh, the commentary, please, if you're watching. About how, how, how to do that glass now ish. Glass now ish. Glass now <laughs> Yeah, it's a work in progress. Uh, so short answer is okay, you're in on Dylan C's at the price, right? I mean, you think yeah. this stuff is good enough to overcome the location shortcomings. And there's always the possibility that he's going to end up on a much better team, if not. But for opening day, probably before the trade deadline this year, it seems inevitable the White Sox want to move him because he's one of their best players to trade right now. You know, we're getting, you know, as we get deeper into these starting pitches, we're getting closer to people who are projected for a four ERA. Uh, we've got him with the stuff based projections projected for a three, six, seven ERA. Mm. Um, and one thing that's interesting that just came out, I was just talking to Jordan Rosenblum, who, um, you know, does these projections and uh, he's working on revising them again. So the next time the rankings come out, they'll have some revised projections in them. And the uh, biggest effect that stuff has is on two things. And this is kind of important because for a long time, we had this dips theory that pitchers had no control over the balls in play. And um, when we looked at how stuff interacts with projections and what stuff projects well and what it doesn't, I figured it would all be strikeout rate, right? Like you have good stuff, you strike guys out. The strongest relationship between stuff plus and outcomes is in two things, batting average on balls in play and home runs per fly ball rate, mm. which are the two things that we've had a really hard time projecting for pitchers. So you look at Dylan C's, you don't need stuff plus to tell you he has great stuff. And you look at a 330 batting average on balls in play last year. Um, and you look at a little bit of an elevated home run per fly ball rate for him. And I think you can say those things are coming back to earth. And that's why the stuff plus base projections um, are uh, about, a, about a third of a run lower than uh, the other projections that are out there. The nice thing is all of them say you're going to get strikeouts. Yes. And I think that's the thing you have to like about Dylan C's is that you can get early round strikeouts at a early mid round sort of price right now that's yeah. built in. We've had Robbie Ray in the past was like that before he sort of found that extra level with his controls. He, I think that's the sort of functionality Dylan Cease will have uh, on a lot of rosters. Joe Musgrove is currently going right after Dylan Cease. That's going to change if he's healthy throughout spring and by all recent reports, both Musgrove and you Darvish have been having normal, healthy off seasons. Both of those guys are going to move up. Darvish might even might not even make the rundown today. He's going a lot later. But Musgrove, to me, also looks like a guy that could be an SP1 sort of in disguise right now. A good option if you waited a little bit to address pitching and you want to try and fortify ratios. And it's just going to come down to health. I mean, the first two seasons in San Diego, 181 innings, really good ratios, ERA, either right above or right below three, good whip. I mean, what's not to like here? It seems like the arsenal has actually gotten a little better over time for Musgrove, too. You know, past injury projects future injury, but I will say that the story of uh, Musgrove's season last year was just one of those ones that 
there's like this kid's book, like Arthur's very bad, horrible, no good, bad day. You know, no, that's not Arthur. It's Alexander and the terrible. That's horrible, Alexander. No good, yeah, 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 Alexander. And uh, uh, and that's kind of the season Musgrove had. So in the spring, he like dropped a weight on his toe and like fractured his toe, and so he was behind all spring. And then like he, I think he 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 kind of debuted a little bit later. Uh, because it, he couldn't quite land on that toe. Um, and then uh, maybe because of the toe or trying to get back or whatever, uh, he got a little bit of elbow bursitis. And bursitis is like, I think it's like a sack. <laughs> something. It's fluid like buildup, isn't it? It's fluid buildup. There's like some sort of fluid thing. And then it got worse because he had, they remember they had that game, those, the, that series in Mexico City. Oh, yep. Yep. And Mexico City is, a, is a really high up in the in in uh, in terms of altitude. So he had some like altitude worsening of the bursitis, um, and uh, and that and they so he had he had it drained a couple times. I don't I don't even want to know much more about that <laughs> draining liquids out of your elbow. I'm, I'm sure that's not painful or anything. Uh, and then I guess it, it, it sort of went up the kinetic chain is you start everything with your legs and you, and it kind of goes all the way to the arm. That's the kinetic chain. Well, it, <laughs> it wandered up his kinetic chain. He had some shoulder inflammation at the end of the season. Um, and that's what felled him at the end of the season. But it's just like, you kind of follow the kinetic chain from the toe to the elbow to the shoulder. And it's all, maybe it's all just from the toe, you know, maybe it's all that the big, the, the, the fact that uh, Alexander didn't get the right cereal in the morning, you know? So uh, I don't know how to deal with this because normally like statistically and health wise, we'd say, well, it's more likely to get injured again, but maybe he just won't have the no good, terrible, <laughs> horrible, bad day. And in the meantime, uh, he showed me his new grip on his changeup. Stuff Plus loved a new, his new changeup, 108 uh, Stuff Plus on the changeup, um, and he had a new grip on it. If he has a really good changeup, that'd be the first time uh, I think he really has a, a pitch that is good that goes the other way. Um, you know, he stopped kind of throwing his sinker so much, and he's been such a spin guy um, where, you know, now he throws his slider cutter and curveball a combined like 55 60 percent of the time um and i think if you if you ramp up that change up a little bit get that to 15 percent or something um i just think that he'll have a a wider arsenal than he's had in the past he obviously has good command really good command all the way through his career uh it's a really good park um yeah i think the only question is innings he was crushing when he went down with that injury. His last 12 starts, Joe Musgrove was 9-1 with a 72-12 to 12 strikeout to walk ratio in 73 and a third innings. If you're doing the back of the napkin math, he was going more than six innings per start on average between the end of May and the end of July when he got shut down. That was a 184 ERA over that stretch. So if he shows he's healthy this spring, kind of backs up these reports, that ADP is going to jump inevitably, but it might be worth paying even an advanced price on this because I think he's pretty easily a top 25 pitcher with room to be a top 15 pitcher in that ballpark. I got, uh, I got a Musgrove uh, cease at 26 and 27. So That's I think I, I would too. take Musgrove over cease generally yeah. just based on how I play, but there's a case for Dylan Cease if you are lighter on K's based on the first couple of starters that you took. Uh, pro tip, by the way, don't fall asleep with a gum in your mouth. That will keep you from having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. <laughs> That's where it all went wrong for Alexander. Oh, not not the wrong cereal in the morning. Oh, that too. It started, but it started with the gum. <laughs> Walker Bueller goes in this range. You've got him quite a bit lower, and I think most people are going to start to back off him relative to this ADP because we got some news this week that he may be delayed to start the season. It didn't necessarily sound like it's because he's having a setback. It kind of sounded more like some preventative maintenance where the Dodgers with their pitching depth are saying we get this series that starts early in Korea. There's no reason to pitch Walker Bueller there. But then when we come back stateside and start the regular season here, we probably don't need to use him right away or we could use him the first time we need a fifth starter. It, more more in that vein than a lengthy IL stint to start the season, at least based on where things stand right now. Some speculation that it might be about uh, about the postseason and right. wanting to have, if you only have a certain amount of innings, where do you want those innings? Where do you want the shape of the season to be? So if you want to leave 20, 30 innings at the end, then you're only going to maybe use him in the regular season for 100 innings. The maybe 75, maybe. Yeah. 
it, it could be some really unusual, careful management for Walker Buehler. Remember, this is the second Tommy John surgery, so you know it's a little bit dicey as far as making sure he gets all the way back. He's been so good as a big league pitcher. 638 career big league innings, 302 ERA, 104 whip, 690 Ks. So even if Walker Buehler comes off his second TJ, and skills-wise, he's 80, 85% of the pitcher he was before that procedure, he's still going to be very good. He's still going to be someone you want to have eventually on your teams. I think the tricky thing for this year in particular is not knowing the shape of the innings and having to really nurse a roster spot for someone that's been going in this pick 100 to pick 125 range. Yeah, in weekly leagues, we've talked about the Dodgers doing weird things, basically having a de facto six-man rotation. And so you're never going to get two starts out of Walker Bueller for a week, probably, is what I'm guessing. Um, and uh, yeah, there was some stuff droppage before the surgery, but I would point out that he's probably hurt, you know? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you, uh, you fix what was hurting and, and you can come out back. I was also say like, you know, I don't think it's, I've said this before, but I don't know that it's really super relevant that, you know, Chris Medlin's career was ended by a second Tommy John or, you know, Johnny Venter's career was ended by a third Tommy John. Like I, I get a different vibe from Bueller's, you know, production that he was actually pretty good for a while and, you know, was posting some innings. Um, and, uh, you know, for some of those guys like Venters, it was like a yearly struggle, you know, um, it was kind of just a quick downhill. So I think that the, there's two things working well for him is that there was a, a fair amount of distance between his two Tommy Johns. Uh, it's, it's better that way. And then he's also still young. I mean, at 29, this is a, a decent decent age uh, to have your second time with John. I think I would guess that uh, he'll be all right. I'm also going to venture a guess that, you know, Bueller might have a say in, in how this goes down because he's a free agent at the end of 2024. So making sure he's healthy and has a, a runway where he can be a regular starter, even if that gets shifted a little further back into the season, that's probably very important to him too, whether it's you know, re-upping with the Dodgers or cashing in potentially to go somewhere else next off season. Let's talk about Tanner Bybee. He's a bit lower in your rankings than he is in ADP. I think he's 47th by rankings for you and he's closer to like 25 or 30 among starting pitchers depending on the day he has a weird homer problem against righties 11 of the 13 homers he allowed last season came against righties i like him because i think the slider and changeup are both pretty good pitches csw is above 30 percent on those good fastball velocity at 94 9 but the stuff number is a 91 so is that where the skepticism for you comes from predominantly with with tanner bybee I think he's uh, another product of the Cleveland Guardian system in that, you know, he's got a, an amazing slider. It's 130 stuff plus, but the four seam fastball and the stuff revision had an 88 stuff plus. Mm. And I, I just uh, up on YouTube, I just took a screen grab of the savant page. And this is a way that I think you can sort of play along with stuff plus and uh, understand what it's saying in, in that you look at the four seam fastball on, um, on baseball savant. They've got this nice color coding. He has less ride than average. Um, and less horizontal break than average. So that's white and blue. And in fact, white for Stuff Plus is just as bad as blue, maybe even worse, because white means average. White means what the hitters see most of the time. And you just don't want to be average. So basically, in a lot of respects, he has an average fastball. The thing that's actually keeping it from being even worse is that it's 94.9. Um, but 94.9 is uh, from a right-hander um, is not as superlative uh, f fastball velocity as it, as it might sound or as it once was. I mean, um, we're working on 93.9 as the average across baseball. For a right-handed starter, I think it's about 93.5. So he's got basically a tick on uh, the average people. And uh, over the course of the season, his fastball velocity dropped. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm a little bit worried about the fastball. I wonder if that was the byproduct of pushing that workload up even more. I think between AAA and the big leagues, we're talking about 157 and a third innings for Bybee. It's a career high. I actually kind of see more like a Zach Gallen sort of starter kit. I think there's an up arrow next to Bybee's name. So could be a fun player for us to have a little side bet on at some point. Uh, I'm not, Let me not as worried about him as you are. I think the market's relatively right on Bybee. He's not an avoid for me. He's actually a pretty fair value, I think, right now. 
Uh, let me get some uh, some numbers on for you real quick, just to give you the uh, how much the velocity dropped. Ninety five five uh, for his first two starts. Uh, his last three starts. Ninety three five. Yeah, getting closer to that uh, that problem area, but uh, I trust the Guardians. I think with a full off season to make some adjustments, maybe he'll lean a little more heavily on those secondaries, get away from that four seamer if hitters are are seeing it and squaring it up better than you'd expect. By That's Z-Lo. true. You know, forty seven percent fastball is still a fair amount. Like he can drop that to forty mm-hmm. and throw the slider thirty and the curve, uh, you know, ten and the change twenty and like you know, kind of move that up. So I am, I'm in on Bybee, you know, the more other skeptic. thing is, uh, that contact rate is exactly average. <laughs> so this is why the projections don't really love him either. Other than ours. Um, uh, let me see what our, our projections have for Bybee. We might like him less. We have a four, three, six, but steamer has a four, two, O ERA. Um, and, uh, the bat has a three, eight, eight. So everyone's uh, baking in regression. Um, we're just baking in a little bit harder, possibly because of that late season. Remember, these stuff plus projections are based on the second half stuff plus. And the other thing I would say, the bat now publicly available over at Fangraphs. Nice to see That's Derek awesome. Hardy's projections out there. 388 and 118 for the ratios. I'll take that. In this range, I think that's... It's fair. I think this is also to a recalibrate good reminder. your brain and be like four three is average now. <laughs> right. Everything's shifted. Like a three eight's not that bad. And I think yeah. given the division, some of the matchups he'll get, maybe that'll play up a little bit too and, and soften the blow if if again that fastball is not How as many wins good as it should be. Get? I don't think pitching deep into starts is a problem. That's so true. I, I think he could 14, 15 wins, I think are within range. You know, as long as they're scoring some runs, I think that's the bigger problem for the Guardians. Uh, we talked about this just a little bit at the end of the show on Monday. You had a new Stuff Plus leaderboard for sliders. And Justin Verlander still pops on there with a 140.1 slider stuff number. He was also 87th percentile in the uh, chase rate on his four-seamer, which was kind of surprising to me. I was looking at the, the pitcher list page, kind of seeing like, what was Verlander doing that was working? He's going into his age 41 season. Only had a 21.5% K rate last year. Obviously a big drop for him. We don't see a lot of guys pitching at this age, but Verlander is a future Hall of Famer, and maybe that he's a year further removed from Tommy John surgery. Like Maybe there's still one more gear he can find. It's, it's the profile that we've said many times. It's hard to bet against him. Uh, do you like him where he's going right now? Do you feel like this is a good bargain, even if his Ks don't come all the way back, if you only get... You know, 24% K rate from Verlander. Is that good enough for him to be effective and give you good ratios over a high volume of innings in this range? Yeah, I I, I think uh, I think it's there for him. The Hatters hit 207 off that slider last year. So it's, you know, it's still a really good slider. Uh, they whiff 10% of the time on that fastball. He throws it high, higher and highest, you know. So um, that's probably where that chase rate is coming from. The command is still there. Um, you know, that's something we're seeing from Max Scherzer, by the way, is that he's losing command of the breaking balls, but I don't, I don't see that, um, on Verlander just yet. Um, so I think that, um, he's, he's a good bargain. And then even if you don't look at, you know, you know, uh, the stuff plus price projections, which I think will revise in a different direction, um, because the, the stuff plus revision liked his slider so much, uh, three, nine, five for him. Uh, and that's about middle of the pack steamer four, two, two. Uh, the bat 400 zips 385. It's, uh, I guess it's surprisingly close to Bybee, and that's why he's going in these tiers. Um, I'm just gonna go kind of with the proven commodity. Um, and I kind of find that these older pitchers are undervalued a lot of times. Yeah, I'm trying not to put too much stock into a K rate that I can't get, but I do think the ratios will be good. Bullpen, of course, is good. Run scoring for him is going to be there as well. Our so I think, projected K percentage is 25%, by the way. And that's above everything Everybody. I see at Fangraphs. So, yeah, you've got the optimistic uh, K projection for the field right now on Justin Verlander. Sonny Gray, the other pitcher that goes in this tier, 184 innings pitched last year, his highest total since 2015. He's now 34 years old, heading to St. Louis. Five consecutive seasons with a Sierra under four. 
Uh, what do you think Sonny Gray will do in his first season with the Cardinals? Uh, more of the same. I, I, the he's he can spin it. He he had that that sweeper by the end of the season last year that ended up being like uh, the best sweeper. Um, you know, in my uh, in my year end uh, look at at the pitches for the season. Um, I. I don't see any problems. I think uh, maybe even Sonny Gray over Verlander. I mean, that's something that I was like looking at back and forth for a while. Uh, the only difference is that Sonny Gray has had some injury history. Yeah. yeah a little more of like hamstring back, a few different things that have popped up for Gray for Verlander. You know, it was the Tommy John several years ago it was the the abdominal core surgery that he had to have, but that's like really far in the rear view. So both have, Injury risk, they've just kind of taken different paths to get there. But I do like Gray where he's going right now, even though I'm looking at more like 150 innings for him than the 180 plus. Maybe I got a little lucky uh, on the home run rate last year. You look at the home run to fly ball rate relative to his previous norms. That was at a career low. Not sure you want to write that in again. That's probably where some of that ERA bump's going to come from. If he's in the mid threes for ERA, it would hardly surprise me, but doesn't mean he's a bad value at all uh, where he's going right now. Let's shift down to the next group. This is kind of like the pick 125 to 150 range where you're looking at Chris Bassett, Hunter Green, Michael King, Merrill Kelly, Jordan Montgomery, Chris Sale, and Bailey Ober. What is going on in this group? Even Chris Bassett sitting next to Hunter Green in ADP. Like, <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't have more different guys. <laughs> like, wow. This is, uh, could, could Chris Bassett give Hunter Green a pitch? Man, if you could put them together, you might have Pedro Martinez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't put them together, so no. you don't. Bassett, we'll start with him just because he goes first. I think he's 30th out of 104 pitchers in ERA the last three seasons, so 341, really good. Tied for 49 to K minus BB percentage, kind of average. 26th in whip. It's just like he gets better results than you'd expect for the underlying skills. How long can he pull that trick off? And and like, do you do you choose that over someone like Green who has this elite fastball slider combo? Like, oh yeah, third pitch would be huge for him, but his fastball and slider are so good that reasonably, like, if the command is good, he could try kind of stridering his way up to. Um, you know, top 10, top 15 status. I think there's a really nice ceiling for Hunter Green. And with Bassett, I think you're just trying to buy ratios and hope that you're not there one year too long. Yeah, that's that's why I'm where I'm at. And I'm going to be the low man on Bassett because I've got him 55. Uh, maybe I push him up, but he's a, he has a 4-5 ERA projection for us. Um he has a C health grade, but I will say that the C health grades kind of run the gamut. You know, there's a lot of different ways to a C. We still, I still hand project him for 194 innings. So I think that's going to be there. I just wonder about the quality of innings. And it's so hard. You look at what he's been. He's been the 19th best, the 35th best, and the 22nd best uh, starting pitcher by fantasy over the last three years. Fair amount of that's from the innings. Um, but every. ERA estimator has had Bassett at least a half run higher than his actual on field results. Um, and I don't know, none of his hard pitchers is over a 91 stuff plus, and his velo is already down to like what 91 9. What was it last year? Let me see. Well, here's the thing about Bassett while you check the velo, I think it was 92 5 is what I see, but this is what you were saying earlier about. You know, Babips and home run to fly ball rates. And you have to look at what a pitcher does. Like every pitcher kind of has their own baseline and it, it can change over time. Bassett has lived in the 265 to 282 range for the last six years. There is something about the contact that he allows that has been able to keep him beating those advanced ERA numbers every single year right like there's there's a reason why it's happening be 92 that. five for the Vila last year but yeah. you know every year it's a little bit lo lower um and and i wish that uh i wish that his location plus numbers were better you know <laughs> uh 101 last year if his location plus numbers are better i could i could sell myself on this idea that like um you know he's a merrill kelly 
who has 105, 106, 107 type uh, location plus numbers every year. And, um, you know, instead, uh, you know, you get these sort of 101s um, from, from Bassett. And uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. I, I, I could just be wrong. You know, like I, I get that. But um, uh, yeah, you watch him, right? Like it's the kitchen sink approach, but he does throw a lot of hard, hard uh, pitches, you know? So I think he still depends on having at least, you know, 91, 92 velo and that velo is only going to go down. So I, I, <laughs> I might be wrong again. <laughs> if we're just probably won't have many have, won't have, have many um shares well i think the problem would be that you don't see that much of a difference between bassett and other guys that go tier seven tier eight where it's like oh yeah they got lots of pitches they've got okay command yes they get innings like it's a more That's replaceable skill set even though he continues to exceed and maybe part of exceeding most years is being in in pitcher friendly environments and and we know the changes they made to rogers center last year had a pretty detrimental effect on the Jays lineup. So maybe that also helps sort of soften the blow of the move into the AL East. Um, I, I think there's a deeper dive that needs to take place for Bassett and pitchers like him. So we can't really dig into that right now. But well, I, have, I did, I did say that, you know, I did last year look at pitchers with large arsenals and good changeups. Bassett doesn't really have a great changeup. I don't think. But, you know, I keep going back to Merrill Kelly, like Merrill Kelly is the type that might um, overproduce his stuff plus because uh, of the wide arsenal. I did find some effect of, you know, wide arsenals and having a great change up, um, you know, outproducing. But the stuff plus revision, I think, has helped our change ups um, a little bit. So any case, uh, yeah, maybe there's there's more there to uncover because I just keep scratching my head. So I think about it. This is this is the thread I'm going to try to pull on later. So help help me remember this. But so think about a hitter like Isak Paredes getting the most out of his skill set because he pulls all of his barrels, right? Mm -hmm. What if there's a pitcher equivalent to that, like not allowing pulled barrels or something? You allow fly balls, but you allow fly balls on pitches that are away or things that are less likely to hurt you, right? But in in all the systems, it's it's just a fly ball. Like it, in the most basic sense of projections, like oh, it's, oh, he's, he lost too many fly balls. The home run rate should go up. No, it shouldn't because he's not allowing the kinds of fly balls that turn into home runs most often. And that maybe is more of a skill than we once thought. Like it's probably something more like that that explains mm -hmm. how someone like Chris Bassett continually beats the projections and beats the ERA estimators. But we'll put a pin in that because that's like half an episode all by itself. Uh, Kelly goes in this tier, so we'll, let's hit Kelly real quick. Unexpected K rate jump as a 34 year old, and it was supported, right? 12% swing strike rate. That was a big improvement, too. He doesn't do it with velocity. It does feel kind of Bassett like in terms of just like, eh, people don't really want to buy into everything he did. So you're not paying full freight, but you're paying a little more than you used to, even though the results just keep turning out profit relative to draft day price so is kelly also someone that you're just a little unsure of because the price is high or if you're choosing between the two because they both fall do you prefer something about kelly how do you kind of stack these two up because they're very similar to me yeah i don't have carry kelly far ahead of bassett i have him uh five spots ahead of him but they're in a, it's in a little bit of a, a tier there braxton garrett is right there you know braxton garrett has the nicest home park but it's that that package of of you know Aaron Zavalli is close there Jordan Montgomery is close there it's a bit of a tier of guys who like have these wide arsenals and good command um but Merrill Kelly had a 105 location plus last year Chris Bassett uh topped out at 103 with the Mets um but he has the same problem Kelly's hard pitches are all below average by stuff plus with his four seamer being the worst and you know you could say well he he did it without that. Like, why why care about it? well, he allowed a 505 slugging percentage on his four seam last year. That's a, a, a fairly big number. Uh, he can kind of play with like, okay, well, I you and I both know, you the hitter, and I, Merrill Kelly, both know that my fastball is my worst pitch. But every time you think you're gonna get my fastball, you know, I'm gonna get you're gonna get a breaking pitch, or you get my change up, whatever. I mean, that's what these large arsenals do. Um I don't know. I just feel like that slugging rate is just going to go up over time, um, you know, as the because as the stuff gets worse on the four seamer, some point 
you know, like just look at Zach Greinke's career. He he was really good and he had good longevity. Um, but the strikeouts started to go away and became less of a fantasy pitcher, you know. Um, and um, you know, that was really mapped against a fair amount against his fastball velocity, even though he's a wide pitcher, he's a this type of pitcher. He that's why I love Granky Granky so much. He was a power pitcher early in his career, but he had great command. And then he kind of morphed into a late career, like kitchen sink and command guy, uh, and added a, a few more years on there with that. Yeah, he, he was like Mike <clears throat> Leak. Mike Leak in his prime was basically Zach Granke at the end of his career. Yeah, exactly. That's a good pull. It's a pretty good trick if you can pull that off. We got a Mike Leak and a Johnny Venters in in the first 35 minutes today. Where else can you get that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Chris Sale, number two in K minus BB percentage among pitchers in this pick 100 to 250 range. Hopefully, the we can homers have 250 are, today. The homers and the injuries are, are, are kind of. Yes. Those are the two concerns. Will the home run rate. Oil. <laughs> will getting out of Fenway help for homers as a lefty pitching in there? Maybe that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah, but Atlanta is also still a friendly place for homers. So, so maybe he's going to be the guy that misses a lot of bats, doesn't walk a ton of guys, but gives up homers, which you can live with. You can live with one of those flaws. Like we say it all the time. 4-1 ERA with like a 1-1 one, one whip and like a 28% strikeout rate. It's really valuable. Yeah, an ERA that fits for this group, a whip that's much better than this group, and but strikeouts injury, that are above average for the group. Injury concerns that put him innings-wise on par with Michael King and Hunter Green, you know, and the guys where you're not sure about the innings. Right. So you have these like massive injury like risks or like innings risks here. And then you have these guys who are vanilla that give you a ton of innings. Like if you could get two out of here, I, I love it. You know, get green or king and then pad it with Bassett or Kelly or Montgomery, like whoever falls. Why not put Bassett, Kelly and Montgomery in uh, in a group together? You throw over in there. I think he's going to have the innings. Throw those guys in a in a group where you say, oh, these are where I get my innings. And I'm going to take my upside in Green King or or, or Sale, you know. I, I think that yeah, there's a there's a chance that Sale like, you know, no, you know, people have seen him less. You know, it's a really kind of a unique arm angle, and then people have seen him less probably on those teams. And he goes to you know new spot, and what if he throws 180 innings this year? You know, totally plausible. But um, you know, you throw you throw those guys in as the wild cards, and you take one vanilla uh, out of this tier. I think that's a decent plan. I've been trying to do stuff like that where I've gotten I've done teams where I got Michael King, um, and then you know I forget who it was, but somebody that was kind of boring uh, after that just to to kind of supplement. Yeah, I, I think this is a good bin to shop in, generally speaking. And with Green, it was a hip injury that cost them time last year, but I'm not not putting a major health concern on him it's just kind of average health risk he throws so hard though i think there's yeah. some health risk that comes just from throwing that hard fair probably sits pretty close to his max too just based on mm -hmm. how hard he throws michael king is probably the trickiest one for me because it's 115 career appearances in the big leagues all with the yankees 96 of them came out of the bullpen he threw 104 yeah. and two thirds innings last year, made the role change. This is a great opportunity in San Diego. It's a park factors lottery win for Michael King. In addition to role stability, the minor league track record includes 149 innings in a season back in 2017 and 161 and a third with the Yankees in 2018. That was the year he pitched for the first time in their system after they got him from the Marlins. Is this just another Drew Rasmussen situation, but one oh. where we have, we have more proof of concept though, that, it works as a starter because he was doing it at the end of last year. Like with Rasmussen, when the Rays started using him in that role, it was like, oh, wait, they're doing that? But the guy that's had two Tommy Johns already? It was like more surprising because it happened after a first half of the season sort of trade. How do you feel about King? And do you think the secondaries and all the pieces are there for him to have sustained success as a big league starter? I do. I mean, his big, his best foot forward is a sweeper, and he uses it against lefties. And so, in terms of stuff plus, it, it's superlative. But in terms of results, it includes a fair amount of lefties getting to take some swings at it. But as a starter, he featured the four seam and change a little bit. He, he's kind of a sinker sweeper guy at heart. Uh, but he featured the four seam and change enough uh, to to profit. And um, yeah, so I believe that he's 
Uh, I've definitely believed that he's a, a starter. Um, and, uh, you know, his that four seam and change both had slugging percentages under 100 last season. And those are his third and fourth pitches. Um, so I, I believe in him. The health grade is an absolutely warranted F. Um, and I think that if you had a, just a philosophy of just having one F on your roster, uh, Michael King is your Tyler Glass now. If you didn't get Tyler Glass now, <laughs> you know, uh, you, if you maybe want to run two Fs out there in like a 10 or 12 team league, that's all right because you, you'll have better options when you go to the wire. Uh, but that's what the, the just the major limiting factor. Michael King had an elbow injury so bad, um, he fractured his elbow and was writhing in pain. Um, as they took him out of the out of the the game, so you know that's just part of his history. I also just wonder, like you're asking him now, this guy who's already had a fair amount of injury, you're asking him to throw 95 and do it for 150 innings. Um, and I think that's just where I top out innings wise. I don't, I can't really see him doing much more than 150, and I could also see him doing 75 and uh, heading to the IL. So, you know, uh, I'd like him a lot. I just just want to, re- you know, refrain from going over totally overboard. I don't know. Maybe I did go overboard, though. I have him ranked 31st. Yeah, you got him ahead of Hunter Green, ahead of Cole Reagans, ahead of Jesus Lazardo. Those are all guys we've either talked about at the beginning of this show or end of last show. So that's a pretty, pretty solid ranking for King. And it's not that far off the ADP, though, either. It's just the market is is very excited about him because there's a lot to like in this profile. Ober is the last one of the group. I've wondered at times if I like Bailey Ober more than the Twins do. They gave him a pretty regular workload as a starter last year. 26 starts, 144 in the third innings. Really good ratios for his career. He's up to almost 300 big league innings with a 363 ERA and a 111 whip. Strikeout per inning along the way. I mean, there's plenty to like there. It just seems home run it took issue. him a while, right, <laughs> to to kind of get to here. Yeah, we've and, been talking about him for a long time. There were some. There was a stretch last year from the end of July until his last start of the year, where he only went six innings one time, and it was his last start of the year against the Rockies on the road. A lot of fours and fives in that game log, which obviously makes it hard to pick up wins. Doesn't make the ratios carry as far as they should. He's unusual because he's very tall, right? He's six foot nine. So he, I think in the past that's caused some issues with the the modeling, but I think he's good. Like I, I think I think they need him to take the ball every fifth day, and maybe they can back off those shorter starts if he's pitching well. Yeah, I as to a clue as to why you know his um, stuff plus is so low. You just he averaged ninety one five you know, on the fastball last year, he is really tall, but he also kind of releases it, uh, releases the fastball from like a two third slot. Um, so he doesn't get a ton of ride, but you know, it is a very kind of unique pairing of size. And like, I don't, I don't know if you know who Sean Hagelli is, but he's just this guy on the giants. Who's like six foot six and throw a sidearm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So like, there's a little bit of that to, to over, um, I'm trying to see here if he uh, changed much in our in our new run. I mean, Savant has seven three for the extension on his four seamer last year, which is even more than it had in 2022. Yeah, uh, Bailey Ober. Yeah, Bailey Ober. New stuff plus 95, old stuff plus 83. He is actually one of the top uh, five starters uh, whose stuff plus got changed the most. So we we are moving in the right direction, capturing whatever it is that Haley Bailey Ober is doing. And I pushed him way ahead of uh, where his projection was because we got a 4-7 ERA projection. I put him right next to Tanner Bybee. Makes sense to me somehow. Uh, <laughs> here are the guys the model doesn't like, but I should like. Um the, the, but the, think about what I said about stuff. Plus, it, it affects uh, home run rate the most. He's got a one four one home run for nine for his career. Um, he's had a two eighty three uh, BABIP, which might be because he gives a fifty percent fly ball. So he's he's a high in the zone guy. Um, but what if that is like a three twenty BABIP or a three ten BABIP? 
Um, and he still has that one and a half homers per nine. That's going to undo uh, some of the good that he gets with the command uh, and the decent strikeout rate. So um, I, I think his whip will be good. I, I think he's demonstrated that ability. And so there's a category that he's definitely going to be in fantasy going to be uh, valuable. in. I think he'll get enough strikeouts. I just think it could be more of a, you know, a, a four, one or four, two, especially if they, they push him. And I do think that, you know, in the past, it's been easier maybe to take him out of the games as like a fifth starter type. Um, but this year, the rotation uh, goes Pablo Lopez, Joe Ryan, Bailey Ober. And you can't take him out of games early if Chris Paddock is the four and uh, Louis Varland is the five. Both of those guys are going to be on the three, four and five and dive plan, you know, because they don't have that innings. They don't have that that build up. Maybe with Anthony Discafani, you've got a guy like a Jake Junis. Maybe that's how they use Discafani, where he comes in and soaks up innings in the middle. But that doesn't that that means that he's probably soaking them up from Paddock and Varland, uh, which means that Ober they need him to go. They need him to go six. You know, they need him to go more than five because they need to save the bullpen some days. Will it be good for his overall stats that if he goes deeper into games? I think it will be okay because I trust that the command is good enough to let the home runs mostly be solo homers, but mm -hmm. you could have some bad luck on that. I mean, like that's, there's a little more risk than you'd think for the ratios he's put up to this point. I think that's the, the final like sign off for me on Bailey over. Yeah. I'm fine at the price. He's not a must have. I think there's a few guys that go right after him that I'm more excited about. Uh, we talked about health grade F a few minutes ago. Carlos Rodon, unfortunately, I think deserves a health grade F in 2023. If there was an felt, F minus. <laughs> if there was an F minus, it felt like a classic case of a player just trying to get back on the field, right? You sign this big contract with a new team, you're hurt, you want to pitch, you want to play. And unfortunately, the results just weren't there, probably because he was not right physically. He was an, inning, an, an ace on a per inning basis. For 21 and 22. No doubt about that. And even, Ninth and 14th best. And that was with missing innings. Yeah, in the, 132 in innings in 2021. Still ninth best pitcher. So there's a really, really good ceiling here. And I think the risk-reward balance is right when you're getting him around pick 150. I find that because I take too much risk early, this is a self-assessment, I think I'm too risky early on that I end up saying, ah, I can't add more risk in the middle. I need to get the safer guys here. I, I need to get a Chris Bassett instead of a Carlos Rodon. And people are saying, well, why don't you take a safer pitcher early and take your <laughs> risk late? And you'll be in a better what spot. If there are no safe pitchers. Maybe that's the real reason. <laughs> All this is to say, like, I get the sense that if Carlos Rodon comes out this spring and he's shoving, the Vila looks good, he's racking up Ks, he's on the same scale as everybody else, you're going to pay a lot more than pick 150 to get him because mm -hmm. people are going to look back at those last two seasons that he was healthy or healthy-ish and they're start going to start projecting him back up towards like the SP2 range and it's going to take a fifth or a sixth round pick to get him instead of a ninth or a tenth round pick. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I liked about Rodon last year was that uh, the you know the four seam had the same velo, the slider had the same velo and movement. There was not that big a difference in his stuff plus from last year and the and the year before um and I, it, stuff plus or stuff like just with the, the small s you know um and so and, and you even look at his swinging strike rate the swing strike rate was pretty good he just didn't turn them into strikeouts and every fly ball was a homer so i i think it was just one of those things that his command was bad because his back was bad and he was able to throw it hard but he had no idea where he was going and so uh, I'm in on it. And I've got a little mini tier here with him and Shane Bieber where, uh, you know, these are guys I avoided last year. I did not buy them last year. Um, but this year, the price has gotten good. I, I try not to have do not draft lists. I try not to have guys that I'm just out on. You know, I just try to have a guy, a place where I kind of, I think this is where the value is. And um with Rodona Bieber, I see enough where I could see a bit of a return to form. And uh, and the price is just so good that it's worth taking a shot. Yeah, I think what would 
keep me possibly away from Rodon is seeing the discount I get waiting for you Darvish 50 picks later. I mean, you've got him 35th. You've got him clustered with Rodon, Bieber, and Sale in the rankings. And when Because I Rodon, love this Bieber little mini Sale, veteran group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Th- these guys are all kind of lumped together. Bieber, Bieber's tough for me to get on board with. Uh, you, you're looking at the fastball velo. That's Before. what we got up on on YouTube right now, and yeah, you know, this is why his stuff plus has fallen. This is why, um, you know, I've been out on Bieber a, a little bit um, because you see, you know, in eighteen and nineteen and twenty, he had a fastball that was ninety three, ninety four, uh, and then in twenty one, it just took a nosedive, um, and there was some injury and. In 2022, he tried to creep it back up, ended the season around 92. Um, and last year, he had a similar story. It was 91.5, and then he ended the season a little bit better off. Um, but uh, when he came back from injury, it was 91.5 again. So this is not a, a reason to draft him. <laughs> it's a description <laughs> nope. of where his career has gone. I would just say that, you know, despite that drop in velo, he's been so good with the slider. And I guess this is you know, shame on Eno for, for missing this with Bybee, I guess, but it's the value of having great spin. Um, and, you know, over the last two years, he's basically had like a, a three, four ERA um, with a great walk rate and like a, a league average strikeout rate. Um, and he's done that with the bad fastball. So why not go load him basically at certain moments? You know, I have him behind Darvish and Rodon because Stuff Plus likes those guys better. Um, and uh, but I still have drafted Bieber uh, in a few places because he shows up so late that I'm like, man, why not? They're not going to play I, games with him. He's either he's going to be in if he's healthy. It's, you know, they're not going to manage. They're not going to do the Walker Bueller plan. <laughs> no, it's his walk year. So, yeah, I, mean, I think for. For all parties, it's probably trying to max him out, try to fix him, try to get it right so he can get something big next winter. 32, uh, he's 32nd among 35 pitchers. Or on trade him run away now. if the season goes bad. Yeah, midseason trade. 32nd, though, in K minus BB, K minus BB percentage. Easy for me to say out of 35 pitchers today. Mm-hmm. It's really, really low. Sierra jumped a full run. He was just more hittable last year. Yeah. Fastball was a big part of the reason why. And Bieber has some durability concerns now. 96 and two thirds innings in 128 last season, kind of sandwiching the 200 innings in 2022 in the middle. So that's significant injury risk as well. It's why he's kind of lumped into this group. Motivated to be on the field this year, though. (laughs) Yeah, I just think I I think of all those guys, like Darvish being discounted the most makes him kind of pop for me as the one that I would try to wait for. Problem is, if you wait for Darvish and someone else gets him, there's not another one quite like him. That's right. There's a little mini tier here. So that can Uh, backfire. I do have a, a little the bit on Darvish. I know that's g- jumping ahead, but let's uh, let's just do it because we're talking about them together. Um, the injury that he has sounds crazy. It's like an Olecron fracture, stress fracture in the elbow. It um, sounds like uh, straight out of Transformers, but uh, what it, it what it is 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 just a sort of repeated stress injury at the end of your elbow, and for some people, they can actually uh, fracture. For him, it hasn't. That sounds bad and gross and not a reason to draft him, except he had the same injury before in 2018. He had a low inning season in 2018. He came back in 2019 and had one of his better seasons. I'm not saying this is exactly going to go the same way, but it's a repeated stress fracture type thing that he stepped off of rest and rehab. You know, it it may come back again. It may end end his career in the end, but it's probably not going to end his career this year because he's stepped off of it and 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 cleaned it up so um i'm cautiously optimistic and uh, there's been a a bit of a yo-yo on him where you can also just be like well every other year uh for the last few years uh so he's gonna be great this year i mean if you really look at it science yeah uh 398 era then a 201 era a 422 era then a 310 era 456 era Question mark, question mark, question mark this year. Yeah, probably, you know, like a 320 with a 0.98 whip. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's the pattern. It's right in. You can even, it's a little bit of aging in there too. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> just those hand projections come through yet again. <laughs> I think it's funny that Bieber is right next to his teammate, Gavin Williams. This young star has got 95 miles per hour at the fastball. Uh, the 126 whip from Williams as a rookie with Cleveland is the worst ratio he had at any stop. You know, ERAs and whips were good everywhere. I wonder if the projection systems are underselling his strikeout rate potential relative to his track record, or maybe he needs some some more tweaks to actually get all the way there. But this looks like a really nice fastball slider combo. And even the curve looks like it could be pretty useful. So I see a lot to like here. If I'm choosing straight up, I actually like Williams more than Bieber. And you've got a pretty big gap between where Bieber is and where Williams is in your rankings. I'm a little worried about the secondary pitches. Um, the fastball, uh, I do like it. It's a two-plane fastball. We've got it at 101 stuff plus. That it's actually, you know, it's for forcing fastballs, they're around 95, 96 on average. Uh, so that's that's comfortably above average. The slider, though, is not uh, by Bian. Um, it, by B has like a 130 stuff plus. Gavin Williams has a 106 stuff plus on the slider. So it's it's decent. So it's a decent fastball slider combination um, where, you know, stuff plus hates the, the curveball 70 on the, on the curveball um, and, uh, and worse on the changeup. So, um, you know, uh, in terms of averages uh, 151 uh, batting average on the curveball against Gavin Williams last year, 288 slugging um, 137 ISO, the batting average sounds good. A 137 ISO sounds good, but it's it's a little bit closer to average than you expect. People don't slug that well on breaking pitches, you know. Uh, for example, the slugging on a slider is 0.065. And that sounds amazing, but I'm sure there's an, a slider out there that has a better ISO allowed. Um, so the curve uh, is okay. I guess if he spins the slider well, then you know, why not bake in some progression from a young pitcher saying, you know, he's already done this. Why can't he, you know, improve the curveball in year in year two? Right. Totally plausible. Right. And, it, and it's a decent foundation with that, that, that velo uh, 96 miles an hour on the four seam two plane movement. Um, yeah. There's, there's some similarities here to, to Bobby Miller, but you know, Bobby Miller is 99s. So you know what I mean? <laughs> I just this is gonna work. I really like Gavin Williams. Yeah. I'm glad I'm glad you have him low in your rankings because it means he's gonna stay <laughs> where he is most likely. It's like max extension too, which I think can make everything play up a little bit. Um organizational trust also there, of course, with pitching. Uh, so I got that kind of convincing me to too. move him up a little bit. Hey, leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, put him put him where you think he belongs. That's that's the the right way to go. Uh, well, Mitch you Keller convinced me to move Cole Reagans up. Hey, that's yeah, I'm very persuasive sometimes. <laughs> Mitch Keller did not sustain the, the fast start he was having. We talked about it, I think, in May June of last year. You know, the possible warts, and he ended up taking a pretty big step forward for the season. It was the career best strikeout rate, career best walk rate. Didn't have a ton of swinging strikes underneath the K rate, so I think there's reason to be a little bit skeptical. The bat was not buying the improvements from Keller at all. The bat is projecting a 460 ERA and a 138 whip from Mitch Keller, which is just harsh. I almost think if, if the would you rather is Bieber versus Mitch Keller, that's a pretty interesting toss up. I think I would just lean on Bieber because he's found a way to pitch really well with lesser stuff at times. But man, that, that's not an easy call to make. The preferred answer might just be, well, neither. There's, there's other options out here that I, I like better than both of these guys. Yeah, a weird thing happened. I mean, one thing that I, I think that Keller has done that that I approve of is, you know, just add velo uh, and add hard pitches to the point where, um, you know, it's hard for people to to sit on his pitches. Um, you know, he, he added the sinker. Um, that was a big deal. And then he added the cutter. Um, the four seam fastball, despite the velo, 98 stuff plus because it's not great. Uh, it's not a great shape. The sinker, uh, good velo, 90 stuff plus. The cutter, uh, good velo, 89 stuff plus. So he's a bad fastball guy uh, with a large arsenal and bad command. 
Uh, that's a, the last part's the strange if, part. If he command, yeah. So you can't put him in the Chris Bassett bucket and be like, oh, he's gonna have good feel and touch on it, all of these pitches. And then the other thing is, over the course of the season, he went from having a wider arsenal to having a skinnier one, especially if you think about it in velocity band. So he did better in the beginning of the season when he was. Uh, he had no pitch. He was throwing more than 25% of the time. And he had five pitches. He was throwing more than 15% of the time. Six to over 5%. So wide arsenal guy, right? Well, uh, in September, he was throwing his, this is the four seam fastball, the cutter and the sinker. All of them, he was throwing more than 25% of the time. So you, right there is three hard pitches, 75% of the time. He's all of a sudden become a skinny arsenal guy. And in terms of velo, that's not a wide velo band. So um, I think he needs to go back to mixing his pitches. Um, I've got him 60th, so I've, I think I've got him below this ADP. Um, but he's still got the 102 stuff plus because he added this great sweeper. The curveball is good. I'm being wishy-washy. Uh, I'm just saying, like, I think he's okay, but I don't think he's an ace. And after the beginning of the season last year, we were all declaring him an ace. Right. And I think what's tricky is there's a few guys that are they're showing better foundations than Keller that I think you'd rather take the chance on, whereas this this could be fine. This could end up being another series of adjustments that leads to a better combination of ratios than what the bat is projecting. Mm -hmm. But how much better are we talking about? Are we talking... 350, like 350 even seems optimistic, like a 380 ERA sort of as the ceiling based on what he's doing right now. It's not going to be a good whip. Yeah, kind of a 130 whip. It's, it's like slightly worse ratios than Jose Barrios, who goes right after him. And Barrios mm. is already doing it. I know we saw some, some surprising downside from Barrios in 2022. All the projections are adding another half run back to his I've ERA. Got, I got Barrios kind of comfortably over Kelly, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's like the easy. Well, I would do that instead. Is there anything left for Barrios, or is he just sort of your SP four oatmeal, a good glue guy on a pretty good team that probably gets you averageish ratios and just racks up K's because he's done a pretty good job staying healthy. Um, I think you know last year was the forty fourth best uh, starting pitcher, and uh, I think that's kind of his upside at this point. There is a uh, downside, the disaster piece that was 2022, 2022, 198th best pitcher. Oh, it was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, stuff is not going to really tell you what happened. That was a location thing. There was also, I think, some personal stuff going on. Um, and I, a little bit of that Alexander's terrible day where, you know, I think sometimes you just get so wrapped up in how terrible things are. You know, that it's just hard to get out of it. Um, but uh, if his upside is uh, the 44th best starting pitcher as he was last year, and I think it kind of is, then it's kind of hard to rank him uh, in the top 40. So I, I've got him just, you know, the low 50s. I think the only thing that could really nudge him up out of that range would be just winning more, right? He won 11 games last year, and five by five leagues wins are so important. They're a good enough team. He can pitch deep enough into starts where. If he gets to 14 or 15 wins, that's your, well, how did he become a top 30 starting pitcher? Not by skills change, just it's by the good fortune of wins. By the Jays hitting better. I mean, the Jays had this weird uh, step backwards uh, as an offense last year. Um, I do think there was some good news in that account today. Justin Turner signing there. Um, I think that's a, that's a big move for them. I don't know if they're going to play him at third or if he's just their DH going forward, but it is the kind of bat that I think, um, you know, can help them along. Now they just need to figure out somebody other than Kevin Biggio, Isaiah Connor falefa David Schneider, and Santiago Espinal um, on their, and their second and third base situation. I think they're still prime for a Chapman return, but um, they're running out of time. And do you think this offense will hit better next year with Turner in the fold and no Chapman. I think there was reason to believe a lot of those guys, Vlad, mm -hmm. Bo, Varsho, would have a little bit of a bounce back anyway. So yeah. regardless of Turner versus Chapman, yes, I think they're going to come back closer to what they were doing in 2022 
than what they just did in 23. I think there's some adjustments that will be made up and down that lineup. There's too many good hitters in that lineup for them to continue underperforming like this. Yeah, and I know they did change the dimensions of the park, but it was one of those things where the walls went higher, walls went lower. Th- some came in, some went out. <laughs> I- I'm not comfortable just being like, yep, that's all it was. Uh, no, also, there's other stuff. If you, even if you look at the, the home away splits, yeah, there were some guys who struggled at home last year. There were other guys who didn't. You know, it wasn't like a blanket. Everybody all of a sudden couldn't hit at home. So, um, yeah, I, I have to think that there's going to be a bounce back there. Barrios could win 12 or 13, but, uh, you know, like a 4 2 ERA, a decent whip, uh, 12 wins. Yeah, it's oatmeal. The guy that you may want from this group is Nick Pavetta. He had a 28.8% K minus BB percentage in the second half, second in Major League Baseball among qualified pitchers. May have heard us say yesterday, Freddie Peralta was first in that category. Is the fantasy baseball community going to get hurt by Nick Pavetta again, or is something different with his arsenal? Yeah, I think there is. I alluded to it in my player count, but I don't think I I fully nailed it because um, I said he's been tinkering with that slider um he now has uh or at least in september according to baseball savant uh you've got the uh, up on youtube you've got the pitch mix uh he now has three breaking balls other than his curveball uh a cutter a slider and a sweeper um and nobody hit his sweeper in uh in uh, in september in fact um if you combine the uh the work on his cutter sweeper and slider in September, you've got four extra base hits in 150 thrown. Um, and you can even throw the curveball in there. Now you've got 250 pitches thrown and six extra base hits. So um, I think it just took him a while. We knew that he could spin the ball because he had this excellent, this excellent curveball that you see is, is still one of his most important pitches. And I think that we blamed... Um, his sort of home run problems and and some of his um, outcomes, results problems on the fact that he couldn't command it. But that location plus didn't ever think that was the problem. I think it was actually kind of a small arsenal problem. I think at some point he was a guy that people were like, fastball, curveball, I don't got to worry about anything else. But if you can really spin it, like think about Max Fried. Max Fried comes to the big leagues and his fastball, curveball, you know, sometimes change. You know, don't you don't have a slider to worry about. Well, guess what? Max Fried can spin a really great breaking ball. He already proven that. Oh, boom. He's got a great slider. OK, you know, like we could have predicted that. That's why I think almost with the Yoshinobu Yamamoto, like he doesn't have a great slider, but he has a great curveball. You think maybe you can find a great slider. So Nick Pavetta now has found three sliders. And I and I believe that's, you know, the biggest part is breakout. Um, maybe he'll settle in on two of those or one of those. Um, you know, but it doesn't matter. No matter what, he's added something to his curveball and, fa- and forcing fastball. So uh, I, I've i liked Nick Pavetta. The only reason I didn't put him higher, and I put him 51, which is probably higher than a lot of people. The only reason I didn't put him higher is because I've been saying that I like him for a long time. <laughs> Just shame at yeah. this point. <laughs> Like, but if I did it wrong it. again, just... <laughs> I have stepped on the same rake several times. So yes, exactly. Somebody with the permanent mark on my forehead from it, I can understand. But he was doing it in the second half. Still had a home run problem, but mm-hmm. showed the best walk rate of any, w- would have been a best full season walk rate of a, of any season if it were a full season. So I, I saw a lot of skills growth it's... from Pavetta. This is this looked like a different guy finally. And I I wasn't getting hooked as often as some other folks were out there because there was always hype, there was always buzz. There were there were always people always like, a bad park, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's still it's still tough, but projections probably are unkind to him relative to what he's going to do. The most favorable one at Fangraphs is a 4.23 ERA from ATC with a 124 whip. I think he could actually beat both of those at least by a little bit. And I think we talked about it with Dylan Cease up at the top of the show. You're going to get some K's to go with this, too. So you might get a little bit of 
negativity with the ratios for stretches, but I think strikeouts are going to be there consistently, and they need him, <laughs> especially after trading yeah. Sale. You're, you're telling me that guy, I think Pavetta's not going to be a starter for them all season? I don't think yeah, so. No. I think he's a fixture yeah. for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I like uh, some of those Boston pitchers better than people uh, in general. One one thing that's interesting is that the larger a pitch is, the more movement it has, the harder it is to command. So you do have this guy who has a kind of plus movement, plus velo fastball, and then a plus movement curveball. Um, you know, adding these harder, smaller pitchers like a cutter and a hard gyro slider might might actually you might actually see it most in the walk rate. He had something to go to on a 2-0 pitch that's not his fastball that might go above the zone or his curveball that might drop below the zone. Now he's got something he can kind of throw hard in the zone. Yeah, there's a there's a way for Nick Pavetta. It's going to happen. This is the year, finally. This is the year. Let's move on to Tier 8. We'll, we'll close it out with Tier 8 today. This is the group that is fitting in before pick 200. So this is a long little Are we list. supposed we to go further than this? Yeah, it's it's written in pencil. Uh, okay. Christian Javier, <laughs> Bryce Miller, Eduardo Rodriguez, Hunter Brown, Shane Boz, plus Brian Wu, Nathan Evaldi, Ryan Pepio, and Braxton Garrett. So nine I like, more. I like this whole here. tier. I think there's one name in this tier I don't like. Uh, let's see. Who do you not like in this group? I'm going to guess that you don't like. Oh, I got it down to two. I think Eduardo he, yeah. Rodriguez. Yeah, it's Christian Javier. Oh, it's Christian Javier. Really? Didn't yeah. wasn't there a point though? Hold on, hold on. I have a question for you about Christian Javier. Wasn't there a point when he broke through when he had a slider that looked like Verlander's slider and a curveball that looked like Corey Kluber's curveball? Did he have that when he broke in? Oh, I mean, I've liked him. I'm not saying that I've I, I, I that I you know never liked him. Um, but he's become increasingly, um, you know, a, a two pitch guy. Like he's stopped using the change up, uh, last year he threw, uh, 88% of his pitches were fastball and slider. And the, the thing that just worries me is that I, there's something fragile about his fastball. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't pair it with good command. Um, and, when he lost just a little bit of his release point and a little bit of his movement last year and, and, a, and a tick, it was, it actually stuff plus was like, this is not a good fastball anymore. Whereas it used to call him like a baby strider, you know? Um, so this month, this has got me fascinated and maybe I'll write about this in the spring is just the idea of the fragile fastball. Like which are there types of fastballs that if you just, you know, subtract a little bit of velo off them, they're just not as good. Um, and so I, I wonder if that's the case for Javier. And in any case, being a two pitch pitcher with bad command puts so much pressure on your stuff plus, um, and, and your stuff just generally. So I, I, I uh, with a below average stuff plus a 4.5, uh, PPERA projection, uh, two pitches bad command. That's just, it's not, this is not a favorite in the group. Yeah, there's a lot to like in this group, so no reason to go after a pitcher you don't like. Bryce Miller, been working on a splitter this winter, maybe working on some other stuff, but we saw the, the video clips of him working on the splitter. It's a big fastball, good control already, and he threw 151 innings last year, so I don't think you're worried too much about workload for him going into 2024. I also think his fly ball tendencies are less likely to bite him as a problem with Seattle as his home park, so i like to see that Zips is on board with me, at least in projecting an ERA under four, because I think Bryce Miller's capable of doing that. I think the, there's 100%. tons of reasons to like him, especially at this price. Yeah, and I like, I like, you know, big fastball with a good secondary who has in the past thrown other pitches. Um, you know, it he was almost a two-pitch guy, but then if, you, if the line for you is 5%, he threw the sinker, the change, and the slider more than 5% of the time. Um, and that slider is like the, the kind of the sweeper that nobody swings at just throwing it those many times says to me, like, he's going to try again, you know? So if he gets that splitter, you know, I think he'll throw it at least five to 10% of the time. And then, you know, he's getting freeze takes on the sweeper. He's throwing the splitter for the swing and miss. He's obviously been able to throw the, the harder, the gyro, the cutter slider, whatever, uh, for whiffs. 
and he's got a great fastball. I think he's a little bit further along than Taj Bradley, who has mm -hmm. similar characteristics in terms of really great fastball with a really great ride. But Taj Bradley is struggling to even put a second pitch on the table that you like. Whereas Bryce Miller said, no, I've got two pitches and I've been flirting with a couple others. Uh, I just think it seems like the type of profile that's a little bit more likely to produce a, a, a third pitch. Plus, if you think about his mechanics, very over the top. Uh, the reason why the sweeper hasn't worked is because everybody can see the different mechanics on it. Splitter is like a perfect thing to give someone like that. Mm -hmm. Over the top, can't really turn it over, uh, you know. You want it to come out release wise, just like your fastball. Uh, I think the splitter is like exactly what, what the doctor ordered for him. Although maybe not the doctor. I know some people think it leads to injury. I'm agnostic on that. Yeah, prove it. Uh, yeah. Eduardo Rodriguez in this group you know, just seems like the the oatmeal -y fail safe. If you missed on the previous tiers of oatmeal, the Bassets, the Kellys, I think Eduardo Rodriguez is fine. Pretty good landing spot for him. Chase Field, as we've talked about, it just doesn't play the way it did. Uh, pretty humidor that used to be a very hitter friendly environment now it's not a bad spot to pitch at all uh, i think the durability issues that he had earlier in his career have started to come down just a little bit you know the myocarditis that kept him out i think that was in 2020 that he problems. didn't pitch yeah like the knee stuff's kind of further in the past we know he lost some time in 2022 for personal stuff that wasn't really a major injury so i think 150 160 innings with decent ratios are likely incoming again for him on a playoff caliber team so i have no problem with Eduardo Rodriguez, where he goes, the thing that kind of keeps me away, as long as this group is full of younger, more interesting pitchers, is that I'm going to keep peppering Bryce Miller and Hunter Brown, Shane Boz and Brian Wu, and even Ryan Pepio onto my rosters if they're all lumped together. I think this is a great bin to get at least two pitchers from, whether you waited or not, because I think you've got growth potential, but you also get pretty good floors skills wise in a lot of these young pitchers. Yeah. And I've still got a D uh, next to Eduardo Rodriguez's name on the health report card. And I know that he's moved past some of it, but even if you just sum up what he's done, uh, you're talking about 157, 91, and 152 innings. That's not that's not great volume. And you know, if you if you have a question mark next to your volume and you're the volume play in a tier, <laughs> um, I think that I will be uh, reaching for the upside in this tier. And there's there's plenty of it. Bryce Miller's great. Hunter Brown uh, showed the you know two really good breaking balls. He has a really good feel for spin. The location plus numbers say that the, the, the command is not as bad of a problem. Um, I read some stuff uh, from Chandler Rome about uh, some mechanical issues that that Brown was kind of um, uh, was having that he thinks he's going to iron out. I, I would I I, I I put some a fair amount of stock in that. Shane Boz is um, a stuff god. You know, and this is the big S or a small S. So if you're looking for just a home run pick, like, you know, especially 10 or 12 team leagues, and you're looking at your like, you know, fourth or fifth starting pitcher, you know, take Shane Boz, man. In a 10 team league, take Shane Boz. I, and, you know, and Eduardo Rodriguez type will be the out there for you later, won't they? Yeah, yeah. What I'm gonna learn, I'm doing a draft and hold right now, where I, I just it's the the Burns Glass now Hunter Green Shane Boz quartet. Like, oh, oh god, fun. oh, but that's a little risky. bit different in, in draft and hold. That's your that's your that's you've got all four of those guys on one roster. Yep, nice. <laughs> that's a YOLO roster. <laughs> I'm really going for it with this pitching staff. Oh, it, it's, it's got Severino and Jordan Hicks on there too. Oh so god, oh god, health, health grade F. <laughs> The whole thing ceiling a got the great F. The whole thing's got a health grade F. Uh, I do like Brown though quite a bit. Draft pitcher with an ERA over five, yeah, no problem. Uh, it's a good place to take your chances. Strikeout and walk rates were in line with what he did when he debuted. Uh, you know, I think the home run to fly ball rate got a little goofy on him, so I think the home runs are going to come down. Twenty one percent is too much. It's really high. All, all the projections are pointing at like a three seven eight to four eleven. ERA, that's fine in this range, especially with the Ks he's going to bring. I think he could actually come in at the lower end of that projected range for the ERA, especially. So I'm definitely in on Hunter Brown this year. I'm with you on Boz. It's only been 40 in the third big league innings because of the injury, but his Tommy John surgery was late uh, September 2022, which means he's very full, far full removed. Yeah. Should be a pretty normal spring compared to a lot of other guys that had it you know, kind of closer to the start of this spring. So uh, not a lot of reservations about Boz at this stage. 
Brian Wu, I think his situation keeps getting better because they continue to move veterans away every time they make a trade. There's like a for a minute, there's a veteran that looks like he could take some of Brian Wu's innings, and then that guy's gone. First That's- it was Robbie Ray, then it was Anthony Scafani, and looks like Brian Wu is pretty clearly in this rotation. That was actually a, a struggle for me as I was ranking because I, I ranked it before, you know, this, you know, I think as the Discofani trade happened, the one that sent Discofani to Seattle. And so I was really, really excited about Wu and I've, I've got him at 41 and I've got Bryce Miller at 42. So I'm, I'm buying those two anytime I can get. Um, the reason that I had Wu one ahead of Miller is that uh, he has, you know, two fastballs and two breaking balls. And I know he's had some trouble against lefties, but I think, you know, I think he'll figure it out with that mix. Um, and so feel for spin is, is hundred percent there with a good fastball, great strikeout rates everywhere. He's been Brian Wu. Uh, so if you can buy the, you know, one or both of the Mariners here, I'm doing it. And then, you know, now we've had the second trade, uh, Discofani trade. Um, and Discofani has left Seattle, uh, to, to go to Minnesota. And so now the, the only guy behind Brian, who's Emerson Hancock, Austin Voth. Darren McCahan, these are all guys that are your traditional six starter types. I don't see any of them having the upside to uh, steal a job from him. No, he looks like he's in a good spot. I hope he can find a way to handle lefties more effectively. 131 and two thirds innings last year for Brian Wu. He skipped triple A entirely. Uh, so maybe 165, 170 is where you're penciling him in as a, a relative ceiling. Not bad for this range. You're going to find between injury risk and guys not having full workloads before. That's where many of these pitchers uh, we just end up topping out. Established that Brun, that Eduardo Rodriguez is the is the the volume play, and he might get 150 innings. Right, so that's yeah. what he's done two out of the last three years. So that's that's what you get. So Nady Evaldi, I love this guy. Uh, you know, he's always great for the first half, and his splits are like you know for the first half and second half are are really different. And you would normally be like. Oh, I don't care about seasonal splits. Uh, he had a 679 OPS allowed in the first half last three years, 757 in the second. Normally, mm-hmm. you say I wouldn't care, except his fastball velocity is like a tick and a half to two ticks lower every every second uh, every second part of the season. So, um, even if you get 140 innings out of Eovaldi, I wonder if it's more like 75 you're happy about, and then another sort of 50 where you're like, I don't know, should I be dropping him? Every week you're kind of looking at him. Uh, Braxton Garrett is the volume play in this tier. You know? Yeah, that might be your floor guy, really. It, it, exactly. He's run a 30% called strike and whip percentage each of the last two seasons. If you just looked entirely at the numbers and underlying stats, he'd go earlier. When you start to dig into things like velocity, that's where you start to ask yourself a lot of questions. But it's a 90.6 fastball velocity average. Like it's mm-hmm. you know nothing special. But he's got a slider, he's got a cutter, he's got a curveball, he's got a changeup. So he's not really that dependent on the fastball. He doesn't throw it nearly as much as other starters. And this, this, this looks like your your young Hinjin Ryu. Like this is the guy that has yeah. a bunch of other stuff that kind of works. Plus, it's got a great home ballpark. So it's not ordinarily a profile that I love, but I do think the park really gives me that added confidence that I'll generally want to just use him for all of his home starts. I can play the matchups a bit more carefully when he has to go on the road. Yeah, the Stuff Plus Revision likes his stuff better, and I'm super happy about that because I kept looking at Braxton Garrett's slider and saying, this is a good slider. (laughs) Why does Stuff Plus say it's not? Now Stuff Plus says it's uh, 119 Stuff Plus on the slider. That is an out pitch. He has an out pitch. He moves the sinker, which is basically average, curveball below average, changeup below average, cutter below average but they're in the 80s so it's not like terrible pitches his four seam is a terrible pitch uh but he doesn't use it that much it's a surprise pitch it's like a pitch he throws with two strikes when everyone's thinking the slider's coming you know it's it's just the way that he mixes and matches around i did say he's the volume play uh he's his max is 159 so yeah, and he just did build that on last that. year but I think he can build on that. And who do you, who do you think is going to have more innings next year? Uh, Braxton Garrett or uh, Eduardo Rodriguez? I'd say Garrett. It's close, but it's I Garrett. Think so. I think it might be Garrett. So there's your volume play. I think the, the Mariners are your best upside play. Uh, I think you probably wait. I'm surprised that Hunter Brown goes this close to that. It must be that a lot of people are using the same projection systems. 
And so that projection is popping out uh, the value to be in this tier. I wonder, I wonder which way that'll go as people get more excited about other people. I, I, do you think a lot of people are going to circle Hunter Brown as a maybe? I don't know. I'm thinking about the order in which the projections become available. So like Steamer oh, yeah. is the first about. thing everybody has. And then ATC comes out and then the bat comes out. And I think the movement probably follows like what each of those systems says. Like if And the bat was a full 0.4 runs higher uh, on Hunter Brown than Steamer. Right. So Brown, I think, kind of holds steady. I think if there's other analysis out there or a great spring, there's other ways he could move up. But I don't think it's happening right this minute. So I'm definitely in right now, probably in at a slightly increased price. There's there's a ton to like in Hunter Brown's profile. Garrett is kind of fun because the range of projections, it starts off at steamer with a 396 and a 127. That's pretty good. So he solid projection. ATC comes out even better, 379, 124. And then the bat comes out and says, no, dummies, 455 and 131. <laughs> so now I just want I just want the projections to have to duke this out a little bit and say, okay, well, who's who's right? You know, like who's who's got this actually pinned down? Because that's a wide range for those those numbers. I mean, especially from the bat to ATC, you're talking about uh, three quarters of a run. And 0.07 on the whip, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, like that, it, it, as the king of waffles, I, I, I sort of waffle around on that. But I will say that I've settled in on um, Marlins pitchers with flaws um, as decent buys in most uh, leagues. Because uh, if there's any chance that you could, you know, avoid uh, Edward, Edward Cabrera in Atlanta – you know, or Braxton Garrett in Atlanta, you can extract a lot more value out of them because it, by the end of the season, a four or five ERA, there are different ways to build a four or five ERA. And if Braxton Garrett builds a four or five ERA by having a five ERA in Atlanta, Philly, you know, and all these other places, but a three five at home, like, you know, you can probably figure that out pretty quickly. <laughs> you know? So uh, I've, I've ended up with Marlins with iffy Marlins on my squads uh, you know, I would do it with the A's, but they're even if you're there. That's that's an understatement. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> with all due respect, yes, there, there is a name here that I think will become a sleeper, or a, a, like a, a hyped sleeper. That I don't know, he may actually kind of go past where I want him. Mm. Uh, and that is, is that Ryan, Ryan Pepio, yeah, Ryan Pepio, because. You know, we do have some small sample numbers I like. Uh, the stuff plus uh, on the changeup matches the eye, matches the eye test. If you watch this changeup, it's a plus changeup. It's beautiful. Actually, you know, if you're talking about aesthetics, I think a beautiful changeup is like maybe my favorite thing because it just it seems to do things that you're just like no, you know, <laughs> like like think of Devin Will Airbender. Like it. Just oh, I mean, Airbender is the most extreme example. But late drop and fade. I, I talked about Luis Castillo yesterday. His changeup yeah. used to be one of my favorite pitches because it God, was just nasty. Him. Like you, you thought you were getting a two seamer, and it, your timing was off. But you're also just missed on location too. Yeah, exactly. It's it's so just it looks beautiful, and it's easy to see from a lot of different camera angles. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas sometimes, uh, you know, especially like a gyro slider or, or or even a sweeper, sweeper doesn't look good by a lot of camera angles. Because you're like, oh, that had 15 inches of sweep. And you're like, well, with the camera angle, it just looked like, Bleh. you know. <laughs> but um, so Pepio had this, this plus changeup and he actually locates it well. But, you know, located for a changeup is probably like a lot of two strike put away outside of the zone and stuff. I don't think he's um, necessarily stealing a lot of strikes with it. So the four seam fastball, 98 stuff plus, that's not, that's, that's good. That's above average. That's good. He's got a good fastball. It, it links up with the VLO. Uh, and this is interesting 100 location plus on 3,331 mm -hmm. thrown. So the, the poor, lo, the, the poor, the reputation for having poor command. I don't know. We just talked about Cease being 97, Snell being 91, Senga being 95. You know, like that, those are the poor locations. He's got 100. He could be average there. Maybe it's a eight and a half percent walk rate. You know, maybe it's a nine percent walk rate. It's not Edward Cabrera problems, which is what I thought it was when he's coming up. You know, I really thought it might be Edward Cabrera. And then the last thing is he's developed a harder slider. 97 stuff plus 97 location plus. That doesn't sound exciting, but I think it's just it's good enough, you know, because he's a changeup guy. 
and people are going to be thinking about the changeup. Like, you know, Kevin Gossman's never had a 97 stuff plus breaking ball, you know, so just good enough. Um, uh, I can see it all being there, but like if people start getting excited and like you're talking about Ryan Pepe you know, all this stuff, like, is there anything that, that reins you in a little bit? Well, so in the brief time we saw him last year, the improved control was huge. And even if you want to give him half of the improvement as a new skill, that's kind of where you were going. Projections, high eights, low nines in terms of uh-huh. percentage. Okay, fine. That's better than what we thought he were going, we were going to get. He's always had the fastball changeup combo. The new pitches he's adding are really interesting. I thought he had a really high... It was yeah, it was a strand rate, ninety nine point two percent. Sure, whatever. It was a tiny and sample a of innings. One eighty nine Babbitt. <laughs> but we're not looking at those ratios and going, oh yeah, he's a true talent, two fourteen ERA guy. It's like no, he's like a right. three eighty guy that is just finally figuring things out from the command and control perspective. So the Rays made him kind of the centerpiece of the Tyler Glass now trade. Club control is a big part of the reason why, but also just believing that he's good is probably the other part of the reason why. So they see something they liked. I liked him anyway when he was still a Dodger. I thought there were reasons to throw him on the bottom of your roster because he'd be part of their machine of trying to find six starters for any given stretch of the season. Injuries maybe? It was an oblique last year. It wasn't a shoulder. It wasn't an elbow. So that's a little bit of a concern, but uh, I, I liked Ryan Pepio. Uh, throughout last season, I was hoping he'd get a shot given all the needs they had. I think if he was healthier, we would have got a much larger sample, right? We would have seen 100 plus innings in the big leagues from Ryan Pepio, and we would have seen some normalization with the, the BABIP, too. The, the BABIP walking, was yeah. crazy low. The BABIP was 189 last year for Ryan Pepio. So there's all sorts of goofy stuff going on here. It's all going to come down to how much the control actually improved. I think it's encouraging that the location numbers on those individual pitches are where they are. I think that points to a lot of this being real. The injury progression, I think is probably where I want to rein it in a little bit. Uh, 2021, he had a hundred innings, 2022, he had 127 innings. Um, and then last year, only 64. So I just don't look at that progression and, and bake in much more than 130 innings or something. Um, you know, I gave him 141 and I feel like that's, that's the top end. So a little bit of an injury risk, um, and an innings risk as maybe the Rays, um, you know, skip him or, or do, uh, you know, the long, the long all-star break type stuff. Um, but where he is, like he's slotted on fan below Zach Littell. Zach Littell is like a lot more closer to losing his job. Like I could see Zach Littell not even being a starter coming out of spring if they have Eflin, Savali, Pepio, Bradley, and Baz all ready to go. Yeah. So Zach Littell looks like an extra guy, but he was really pretty effective. A 393 ERA and a 115 whip over 87 innings with the Rays. Did it with a low K rate, but a low walk rate. So uh, I'm fine with that. That's a, it's an okay bundle. Not a bad guy to have for depth, but not somebody that you're excited about right now just based on the number of guys ahead not, of him. Not really a fantasy draft for me. No. Deep, deep leagues. Mono leagues, draft and hold, sure, for depth, but for 12-team leagues, especially 10-team leagues, no interest. 15s, maybe for your last pick, depending on some of the updates we might be getting closer to the start of the season if we find out that some of these other raised starters might not be ready for the season for one reason or another that might open the door for him to have some early season value. But yeah, the in, Ryan Pepio looks solid where he's going right now. He's definitely on that target list for me. And where are we landing for like 10 and 12 team? Like for a 10 team league, these are your final pitchers. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, maybe they're even bench guys, depending on how aggressive you are with your strategy. And so. uh, in 12 team leagues, you're there, you know, you'll have another pitcher or two after this, but you know, I still think in a 12 team league, you take the shot on Pepio, Wu, and Miller, even if you have, uh, you need more innings because uh, your next picks can be can be more boring and you've still got a, a decent wire that you're dealing with over the course of the season. Um, I'm not saying that you necessarily need to go full YOLO like you did on that draft, but uh, the, 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 the shallower the league, the more you should be drafting for upside, I think. Yeah, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, <laughs> the, the rosters I build are for me. They're, they, are, <laughs> they are not to be replicated because they well, are. Well, it's funny because in a 10-team league, I would love to have your your your, your starting pitchers. 
I kind of looked at it like this. This is um, this is a first pitch Arizona draft and hold, so it's not even there's not even a money component. I'll probably try to do like some side stuff against people just to see if this works. But uh, I don't know if I would do this with actual. Who did you put as an ace on, on top there. of it? Burns. Okay. It's Burns, Glass now. Oh, Green, oh Glass now. <laughs> and Boz. Yeah. Green and Boz. Burns, oh Glass now, Hunter Green, and Shane Boz, and Class A as a closer. Oh, love it. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's either going to be amazing or a disaster. There's no yeah, middle ground really, here. It really could be. Well, it could be the middle ground. I could have half these guys stay healthy and half get hurt. And <laughs> there we go. But uh, still a lot of ground for us to cover on part three of the series. So hopefully uh, we'll, you'll uh, tune back in for that. I'm also doing a, a battling closer ranks with Greg Jewett, uh, who does the closer ranks uh, on the athletic. We're going to we're going to both uh, do a run at it where we uh, both do our tiers and and sort of comment on it. Nice. That'll be really good. Greg That'll stuff's really good. Friday, too. Yeah. That'll be synced up nicely with the reliever episode coming out on Thursday. But part three of our starting pitcher preview that'll drop on Wednesday. Hopefully everyone out there is keeping up. I mentioned it up top, theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. $2 a month for the first year gets you in the door with a subscription so you can read Eno's rankings. You can read the upcoming piece with Greg about relievers plus everything else we have on the site. Really good price for new subscribers at just $2 a month. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. Be sure to drop us an email if you've got questions for a future episode. Rates and barrels at gmail.com is the best way to get that to us. Part three of our starting pitcher preview drops tomorrow. Thanks for listening.